A quick note from the editors. This episode is a special episode of Medicine the Machine to celebrate Bellevue Literary Review's 20th anniversary. The program premiered earlier this week on the BLR and Medscape YouTube channels. But if you missed it, here's the discussion with our host, Eric Topol, and Abraham Verghese with Daniel Ofri, the editor-in-chief of Bellevue Literary Review. Enjoy! Hello and welcome. I'm Danielle Ofri, the Chief Editor of the Bellevue Literary Review, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to COVID Writing Goes Viral, How Literary and Social Media Writing Became a Lifeline During the Pandemic. I'm so excited to be joined by my colleagues, Abraham Verghese and Eric Topol. Uh, Dr. Verghese is a professor and vice chair of medicine at Stanford University. He's also a best-selling author of Cutting for Stone, my own country, and the tennis partner. Dr. Topol is a cardiologist and founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute. He's also editor-in-chief of Medscape. His Twitter account has been considered one of the most reliable sources of information about COVID. His most recent book is Deep Medicine. Welcome, Abraham. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, you know, we're here kind of at the one-year mark of COVID. And I'm wondering if, um, even before we start, if each of you might want to reflect on what the the one-year mark feels like, and uh, and then may perhaps relate it to what you've been reading as we uh, hit this one-year anniversary. Well, uh, shall I go first, Eric? <laughs> sure. um, you know, it's interesting. I was just thinking one year ago, I was sitting with my editor in uh, New York, and a uh, little, little more than a year ago, end of February. And it was a time of innocence. I was very aware of COVID. We had a few cases here in the area, but not many. Um, and uh, they were not, for the most part, blissfully unaware of it. I was very conscious of it walking through the corridors and going to restaurants. And, you know, look at, look at what's unfolded uh, since then. I was meeting with my editor about a novel, and uh, that novel is still, you know, all I've been doing all year, but really thinking about COVID, and I'm sure influenced by the strange experience of being confined to some degree of all the changes we saw in the hospital. So it's been a, it's been an epic year. I think it was Stalin or Lenin who said that, uh, you know, sometimes weeks go by and they seem like years, and then uh, a year goes by and it seems like a week. And that's kind of how this feels, you know? <laughs> how about you, Eric? How do you feel on this one year-ish anniversary? Yeah, I mean, I think back to February 29th it was the first death in the U.S. And uh, there was a sense of denial that it was going to go away somehow. And uh, in, conf- in conferring with my colleagues, some, one of whom is particularly an expert in outbreaks and pandemics, Sir Christian Anderson, he said, it's coming, it's going to be big and bad, and was he ever right? So, I mean, it's been a year of tragedy, which... Uh, also now uh, we see the light with the, the effects of vaccines, which really are a miracle. In fact, just today I was discussing with a fellow who I thought was actually very intelligent. I said, um, are you going to take the vaccine? He said, no, it, 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 it happened too fast. I don't trust it. <laughs> so uh, you, you just can't win. You know, you, you have something that is truly a, one of the greatest triumphs of, of medicine and science research in history, and you have people thinking that there's something wrong with it because it's so good, too good to be true. So, you know, it's kind of the best and worst all packed into one year, but I, you know, I think it's exciting to know that uh, we're moving, you know, towards an exit ramp of some kind. It's interesting to think of COVID as its own narrative, as its own story. You know, I think back to where we were at Bellevue a year ago in March, we really thought, you know, this was going to be like Ebola. You know, we were set for Ebola. We had our, our E unit already, you know, with four isolation rooms, we could handle whatever comes through the door. You know, Ebola, some other hemorrhagic fever, yellow fever, plague, you know, it comes to Bellevue and, and we have the resources for them. And that was really the thought. We have the E team, the Ebola team already. And, and then the rest of us will just keep doing our stuff. And I think we did not have the ability to imagine how the story would would play out and and you know and each day it was like you know the page just kept turning and you know when you talk about a page turn this this was it every day was a new you know dramatic action 
And, and you know, and I, and looking back now after a year, so much has happened, so much grief and sadness, but also so much written. And I'm, I'm really intrigued. I think we all are by the written word in its various forms. And I'm wondering, maybe Abraham, you could take this first, you know, when did you first notice sort of an up, uptick of writing, either journalistic or literary social media, as the pandemic unfolded that made you think, huh, we're, we're someplace new? Yeah, I think it was evolving so quickly that uh, the kind of, you know, writing that uh, we might be used to seeing uh, that really developed their theme really didn't work, I would think, because, uh, I, I mean, I thought it didn't work because they simply didn't have the information. And so I found myself much more inclined to reading people like Eric, for example, who were, you know, topical and it was changing every single day, even as it is right now. So I think it really represented a shift for me, at least, in recognizing that the sources that I might go to were already old by the time I saw them compared to, say, Twitter and and more immediate sources like that. So that was the big change for me. Yeah. I'll actually second that because, I mean, for me, up until, you know, last year, I really saw social media as a sort of like, you know, fluff on the side. You know, there were some fun, witty, and cute things, but it didn't really exist in any needful way. And this was the first time where I saw the real utility of this. And I agree that, Eric, you were one of the, the lifelines there that the information was coming out. I mean, in the best of times, I don't have time to keep up with my journals and, and all the reading that we should be doing. So I rely on journal club and, and colleagues. But in this environment, when really things were changing so quickly, it was really helpful to have someone, you know, like you and many others. And, and maybe you could talk to how you, if you saw your social media life change during COVID. Oh, no question. Uh, Danielle, back in uh, late February or March, uh, I kind of made a conscious decision that I was going to get deep into this. Uh, it was kind of a natural since I'm an information junkie mm -hmm. and I, you know, re look at journals and the newspapers and, you know, whatever sources to see if I could help provide some navigational uh, uh, component for us, for at least the science medical community, if not other people who wanted to follow. So I started, you know, I, I, I think double or triple the number of posts I would do in a day quickly. And that's been maintained, you know, for the year since. So, you know, it, it, it kind of took over my life because then, you know, if I, if I wasn't putting a lot of information out, people thought maybe I wasn't alive or something. <laughs> something was wrong with me. I, I did <laughs> want to ask how many hours a day do you spend or did you spend during the peak of the pandemic? I mean, the things you put out there were thorough research. You had clearly read the whole paper, highlighted the information. Was that your entire day? No, no, but it, it is, uh, I get up early just so I can read. So I usually do two or three hours of reading early in the morning. And then, you know, it's not much during the day, you know, a little bit here and there. And then in the evening, again, it's about a couple, few hours. So, you know, it's it's mainly the, the, the uh, beginning and ends of the day that I'm able to get the reading in. But the other thing I would just point out is, I uh, archive, that's the way I keep track of everything is through Twitter. So, you know, I, that's perfect for me. It's not only sharing, it's also helping me because then I can find stuff again. Oh, really? So you, that, that's your file cabinet now? Yes, it has been off for the last 11 years. So it kind of got convenient because, you know, even though I was putting up a lot more stuff, it, it helped to have it all so well organized I could get to anything I, I wanted. That turns out to be really helpful when you're trying to figure out, you know, what, what you barely remember from, you know, week or month or whatever earlier. Is that something, Eric, that you do through Twitter? Is that a function of the Twitter or something you do separate from it? No, through the Twitter. Um, you know, there's a, um, a mytweets.net uh, and um, you know, basically have it all filed in there. And if I just put in the topic, hashtag or whatever and any extra word i can find you know any one of these tens of thousands of whatever uh tweets about covid so yeah no it's it's actually a really uh, great way to to keep track of stuff that's wonderful yeah the other big thing i found on, on twitter mainly um was the educational aspect i mean there was a real switch to like a very in some ways, old fashioned way, uh, like the quick on the fly journal clubs. I mean, there were little tutorials on vent management, ABG refreshers. I mean, things that I, I really needed and I found them so helpful or 
discussions about what people are doing, or proning, um, how to interpret x-rays, you know, in, in the age of COVID. And that, I had not seen that before, and maybe I, I had missed it, but I found it in a, in a utility, in a way of, and, and you know, getting an educational uh, little tutorial from someone in Italy, you know, that I had never met before, but now they can teach it from their experience. And, and you know, and, and Abraham, I mean, you are so involved in education. Do you see this as changing somehow, the way we're going to, the educational model we're going to use? I think it already has. I mean, the other thing that happened for us is that our grand rounds where we would have, you know, maybe 200 people became this event where we had a thousand people and it was all by Zoom. And I can't see us going back to the old model without combining it with that, with some sort of function like that. I will say though, I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a Twitter expert. But I read a lot of it, but I've never really quite got the hang of it as Eric likes to, likes to tease me. But there's an important function that uh, we all exercise consciously or not, where you really have to filter out the stuff that, you know, makes its way to Twitter uh, that you wind up looking at, you know, because something has been retweeted by someone you know. And this filtering function is so key. You know, you really have to listen to the people you want to listen to and start making value judgments about some of the other stuff you hear that you begin to realize, well, wait a minute, this is a bit more on the fringe than I am ready for, you know? And that was interesting to me. Yeah, although sometimes we wonder if, if because the uh, it is sort of pre-filtered by who one follows, who, was, who one doesn't follow, whether you're not ever learning, there's a whole other thing out there that maybe I'll never learn about because somehow our little worlds don't overlap and you can make the analogy politically or socially and other things, but even just educationally, that maybe I, I am not missing out on the people who are reviewing these other journals and I'll never learn about them. And, you know, that's just happenstance because of who I happen to be following. Yeah, one of the things that um, uh, the bright spot, I mean, I want to acknowledge what, what Abraham mentioned, um, the bad information, disinformation um, stuff is, is certainly uh, an issue that has to be dealt with. But uh, what I found... Uh, I have found especially stimulating is um, this transdisciplinary, um, you know, making friends and uh, having, you know, all these new uh, synapses worldwide. So I, I, you know, just yesterday I wrote a piece with uh, Roberto Bironi, who's the Tony Fauci of Italy in <laughs> medicine, and he's become a good friend. And I had no idea that some 25 years ago he was at Scripps Research as a postdoc. Yeah. Um, and, and Eddie Holmes in Australia and all these different people in different areas, whether it's virology, immunology, structural biology, I mean, it just goes on and on. So it's been uh, the most intellectually stimulating time of my life. Um, and I don't even have any background in any of this stuff. I don't know anything about infectious disease or immunology, virology. In fact, I used to avoid all that stuff. But it's, been, it's, it's very interesting, it really is. What Eric has done so well uh, in our podcast, Medicine in the Machine, Eric has really brought to us uh, or introduced to for us, you know, scientists who I think, uh, I'm not sure I would ever have known of them, but their voices had emerged on Twitter as being reliable sources of information in epidemiology and virology and, you know, in various fields. And I think, uh, you know, I sort, of, I sort of got to watch Eric you know, do that, sort of find the right voices on Twitter. And if you're following him, then you, you wind up learning about these other folks as well. And I found actually a parallel issue, if I can switch the conversation a bit to sort of the literary writing or journalistic writing that came out of COVID, in which there was a lot. Many people wrote about their experiences. They were so intense. And I found it was a way to learn about what other people in the hospital do. You know, nurses were writing, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, you know, cafeteria workers, uh, nursing people working in nursing homes, you know, things that you might not come across in your daily little world. Um, and talk about interdisciplinary. I felt that there was um, this chance to delve into the world. Right now in, in, the, in the BLR, we're publishing this fall, uh, two of our prize winning essays are, are fiction. And one is by a physical therapist um, who during writes a piece about a physical therapist during COVID, I never really sort of thought about the physical therapist connection to the patient and how, you know, that works. And then another piece that we're publishing is the um, public health worker who sent to go talk to some recluse and let them know about the pandemic and try and get them to wear a mask. And, and you know, some poor young recruit who draws the short straw has got to go out into the countryside and deal with a, a, an ornery old person. 
you know, I didn't really think about what those people do. And I think there was quite a flowering uh, of narrative writing and, and essay writing. And, and, you know, Abraham, anything that you've read or perspectives that have caught your eye? I think very much like you, I was, you know, intrigued by many of the personal narratives. There are so many of them, you know, and again, you need the filtering function. I must say, I think uh, I found it really helpful to reach back to, you know, older narratives and make comparisons, uh, whether it was, you know, Camus' The Plague or the Decameron, and find that, you know, as much as things have changed, some things haven't changed at all. And I've been really intrigued by the dissonance between the wonderful science that Eric talks about and the sort of degree of social discord and disjunction between uh, that and the real scientific facts. In fact, uh, maybe unlike some of you guys, I actually sometimes search on Twitter under names like Scott Atlas, who is you know, one of our <laughs> former colleagues here, just to see uh, and, and to sort of remind myself how you know, we can make all these advances in science, but if we don't make advances to change the narrative uh, that, you know, change, that affects behavior in such negative ways, we really haven't advanced that far from, from Camus, uh, you know, who, who said there have been epidemics forever, but it always comes as a, as a surprise. And there's always this other element that you have to deal with beyond the plague itself. You know, one thing, Danielle, that I noticed um, throughout the pandemic is the Atlantic magazine. You know, I had never seen it shine like this, mm. but it had such extraordinary pieces on the medical side, the science side, you know, every aspect, whether it was Ed Young or uh, Zainab Tufeki or, you know, so many people there have written some extraordinary work, some you know, major long reads that are, you know, like multiple book chapters, but you know, well worth it. I, I uh, was surprised how they really came to life uh, in so many respects. And also that they got behind the data tracking. So interestingly, you know, the CDC had failed, it didn't even show up, but they, they sponsored this COVID-19 tracking project. So for a magazine to contribute in that way, really differentiated them, um, you know, from so many others prior to the pandemic, at least, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, I actually felt the same way about The New Yorker, which seemed to be almost like a scientific and social resource. There was such intense writing, both, you know, sort of on the ground, first person writing, but also just scientific background. I'm, I found it educational. Uh, and, and in fact, when Lawrence Wright had his last piece, The Plague Year, which mm -hmm. I think was maybe 70,000 words when it turned out was, was still 35,000 words. in the. I mean, I almost didn't read it thinking, oh, can I live through this again? <sighs> It was riveting. It was an, oh, yeah. absolutely yeah. riveting. Um, and then I realized you know, he had published a, a novel about a pandemic just, you know, in 2020. And now here he was writing the nonfiction uh, counterpart. Oh, um, you're, you're right. That was the whole issue. It was amazing. Was amazing. Yeah. 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 And actually, maybe we could step back a little bit, as Abraham intimated, and think about some of the other things that we have read, you know, uh, in, in the past. And I, I thought a lot about Jose Saramago's blindness you know, the, the plague of blindness as, as this metaphor, you know, and, and I wondered how many of us became blind during this uh, epidemic, blind to facts. And, and right on the one hand, as you say, the medical profession, the healthcare work, world actually became quite unified during this. You know, we really were in this boat together in a powerful way, but at the same time, our the world around us seemed to shatter and, and the amount of blindness just staggered me. And I'm wondering if you want to share anything that you've thought about that's reflected upon what we see today. Well, uh, maybe I'll begin by saying that um, I used to teach uh, Camus the Plague in various different settings. So I thought it was a book that I knew well, mm -hmm. but I saw it in an entirely different light uh, this last year. Uh, I actually saw the, the genius behind it. I mean, here's a guy who I don't think he actually lived through a plague. This was a imaginary town based on a city in, Al in, in Algeria, but he really anticipated all the social ills that uh, we saw. And I think there were entire passages of the book that I had read before without really appreciating what he was getting at and seeing it sort of come into play, uh, you know, this year uh, with us. So, yeah, I think that, that to me that was still the most that's still the most intriguing story for me is the social discord and uh, i'm a very slow writer as you know so i think it's going to take me a long while to you know to sort of tr translate this into something meaningful whether it's a, 
a short story or, or, or whether it informs a novel. Uh, but I, I mean, think there was, a, there was a great deal to learn there. Welcome to Medscape's latest podcast series, Medicine and the Machine, featuring Medscape's Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Topol, and Master Storyteller and Clinician, Dr. Abraham Verghese. Remember, you can find the latest in medical news, expert perspectives, clinical tools, continuing medical education, and more at Medscape.com. Yeah, I mean, you yourself have said often that describing fiction as the great lie that tells the truth. And I think Indeed. these are some examples, you know, love in the time of cholera uh, also comes to mind, you know, in the way that magical realism, which you would think is just the wrong thing we need at a time when we need facts, but sometimes the magical realism feels like it explains things in a way that the actual facts don't. And I was thinking, uh, the other things I was thinking about is all the writing that, that took place during the AIDS epidemic. You know, so a generation before, you know, there was a a lot of I think healthcare workers who, for the first time, were writing and 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 journalists. I was thinking about and the band played on, um, and how that was sort of formative in 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 shaping the narrative of the epidemic for history. That became the the draft of how we look back on it, and I think we didn't really have it till people wrote about it. And I, you know, wonder who will be writing the book on this narrative of, of our current pandemic, and maybe it's going to be this collective narrative that we create with all of these uh, strands of writing. My suspicion is that um, you know the HIV epidemic was very special. It really began affecting very discrete groups, and their voices were already not being heard very well. Uh, so, for example, from for me, it was my first awareness of uh, uh, you know I was not homophobic, I was homo ignorant. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, as a ID physician, I became intensely aware of gay men and, you know, had so much that I learned from them. So I think the, the literature around HIV was also very much literature uh, about, uh, about gay men and about their lives and about their struggle and being marginalized. Mm -hmm. I suspect this epidemic to me, as it will be much more like something like the Great Depression or World War II. Where, as you said, it's going to inform all narrative. It's going to infuse itself in, you know, generations of kids, or at least this generation of kids and adults, every time they talk about their lives. Yeah, I mean, there's been a couple of pandemic books already out there. Uh, one by Nicholas Christakis and another by Fareed Zakaria. Uh, the, you know, I think it's premature to write the book on the pandemic. Um, and to try to predict where we go from here, um, because we're still in the midst of it. I mean, I, I wish uh, we were further along, but you know, it, hopefully, you know, later this year we'll have a better sense. I also think that um, the the idea of being able to avoid something like this in the future. Um, I came across this thing written today about actually in National Geographic about. Uh, this being described as uh, a natural disaster when it actually is a man-made disaster and how we, we aren't putting in enough nearly effort towards climate change and all the things that we're doing to our planet that induce this sort of thing. So, you know, there's just so much we can learn and hopefully, um, you know, avoid this catastrophe in the years ahead. So I'm still waiting to see. There'll be so many books written, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm waiting to see the book. Uh, I, I actually, either one of you could do it. I know that. <laughs> My money's on Lawrence Wright. <laughs> that way there. Uh, one narrative we didn't talk about, uh, Danielle, which I think is important to point out, is really the healthcare narrative. I mean, you alluded to it, but you know, the the initial period when our house staff, especially you know, in all the various hospitals, especially in New York were under so much stress and under so much personal risk while dealing with their own families. To me, that was a very poignant story. And, um, you know, we couldn't quite be in their shoes. We were always, as attending, always one level removed in, this, in a sense. And, and I think that this is going to color their, the way they shape medicine in years to come, the style of medicine. I don't quite know how, but they really have been battle tested and altered by this in a way that uh, per perhaps you can share your own view on, on what's happened with the house staff at Bellevue. I think this will be their defining um, um, sort of characteristic of the kind of doctors that they are. And I think it will, I, I believe, create a certain resilience uh, of just being flexible that, you know, 
things are the way they are, that's not good enough. You know, you, to be uh, um, able to move on a dime is just a different way of, of thinking and, and that knowledge is very fluid and maybe there'll be less sort of, um, you know, kind of ground in, cemented into certain views because they're used to being um, in a changing in environment. But I think as to what you mentioned that, you know, psychologically and personally, I think many were uh, harmed in a way that maybe didn't happen for other generations of trainees who weren't, you know, put to this, to be put at that risk and often without the recognition um, or, or re- remuneration that, that was deserved. And I think about also the medical students, many of whom were graduated early and tossed into the you know fire as well um and then i think about um all the you know the nurses who were traveling from other places and you know came voluntarily you know to new york during our our you know worst of it or traveled to other places that needed it you know what an experience and of course you know some of them many of them did contract covid and and you know not a small number you know, perished um you know around the world it's not a small number of healthcare workers and, and that part is is heartbreaking when you see that people have gone you know to do something to take care of people in the most difficult circumstance and have gone ill or or have died uh that's a, a tragedy that i think a lot of generations of trainees have not faced so this is really something i think significant for this generation well, something that also came out of it uh, in a positive way, not only was there a common enemy, uh, the virus, uh, for the health care workforce, and it's already mentioned just extraordinary writing about people's experiences. And as you say, Daniel, not just uh, physicians and nurses, but the entire profession, including, as you say, physical therapists and pharmacists and paramedics and, you know, on and on. But what is striking is not only this was occurring on top of burnout, there was already a global burnout crisis. And what could have been the result without protective gear and with all the things that you would have thought would be the priority, could have been um, the turning point of the most, uh, the worst time in medicine. But in fact, it was a rallying cry. And what's interesting is more applications for medical school than in history. That it actually put, put the profession out there to the public and to young people to be a, a, an a, a alluring path which is really striking because as you say put it at risk put it in the fire and then more and more people you know now are craving to be physicians and i think that's probably true across other uh, specialties in healthcare too so it's fascinating what the impact was what, what had actually over time Right. In some ways, it's changed the story of what it means to be a doctor or, or a nurse. And I think we had kind of a couple of generations in there, a couple of decades, where it was a little confusing as to what, what is the narrative of a healthcare worker. A lot of it, there was issues about money and, and, and reimbursements, and, and, and a lot of it was technocratic. And, and I think a lot of the burnout did come from that. And this reminded us of the sort of the really baseline of what it means to be in healthcare, of taking care of patients. Um, uh, our medical director, Nate Link, just published a book called The Ailing Nation, where he looked at our nation as though the US, as though it were a patient with a chronic illness and kind of took the chief of medicine kind of look at it, which is a fascinating book. But one thing he did, I was just reading an excerpt that, you know, when it came to the COVID pandemic, you know, listen, people in the hospital, we've got different political views and personal views, but it was time to take care of patients. All that was dropped. Like there was no question that everyone puts all that aside um, because that's a profession. That is what you do. And, and there's no, no doubt that, that would happen. Um, whereas, you know, in politics and many of our leaders, sadly, that was not the case. They didn't drop everything and say, okay, we have this most important thing. Everything else is secondary. And um, it, it reiterates, I think, why we're all in this profession and why people want to be in it because there is a moral clarity. And I think a lot of people during the pandemic were suffering from a um, not just boredom, but sort of a lack of purpose. And that was the one thing we, you know, we didn't have that problem. We had, you know, more purpose than we needed and, and more to do. Um, but there's something that, that I, I think helps us with the morale. And I won't, you know, at all want to, you know, um, paint over the other difficult issues in healthcare now and the true burnout that is still there and the moral injuries that are still there. But it was helpful to get that reminder of really what is the underpinning of the profession. Um, I was going to shift back another book that I was looking back at. Uh, it's from a couple of years ago called Contagious by Priscilla Wald. Uh, 
um, who I think is an anthropologist or sociologist. And, and she was really interested in this idea of the outbreak narrative. Like why do some illnesses, you know, take hold? And, and she was um, positing that what makes a certain uh, illness really grab us is it's got this sort of, this outbreak narrative that it comes from deep, dark, you know, the primitive world, and then it emerges out and it takes over the civilized world. And so, you know, you end up with, you know, movies like Hot Zone that, you know, this grab you, you know, Ascaris, you know, malaria, no one's making, you know, big movies about diarrheal illnesses that, you know, kill many, as many, or if not more people. But, and, and COVID, you know, a little like SARS and avian flu had a bit of that too. And I think we saw that in the beginning that, you know, coming from, from China and from the market. In fact, I had a conversation yesterday in clinic with a patient about the vaccine. And she said, I don't want to get it because it comes from bats and rats. And I was really trying to explain that, that although the virus came from bats, that the vaccine doesn't come there. I could not convince her. It came from bats and I'm not putting, you know, bats and rats in, in me. It's such a powerful narrative. I remember, uh, you know, when I first came to this country in uh, 74 for the first time, the movie that was playing was Jaws, <laughs> a blockbuster by this unknown director, um, you know, um, who's very well known now, as you know, but it was a monster from the deep, you know, and it came up and terrorized this small town and a couple of people stepped forward. And uh, it was pointed out to me in a, in a book I was reading recently that this is really the original oldest narrative in the world, the narrative of Gilgamesh, you know, rec recorded on cuneiform script on 20 stone tablets. It was about a monster, Hambaba, and the and the uh, hero Gilgamesh, and he gets special powers and special tools. And in a way, we've been retelling that story ever since, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're right. I think there is a monster narrative. Uh, and the nice thing about those narratives is that it's never just one hero stepping forward. It's they step forward and they find resources within themselves or they find, you know, special powers and special tools. And it's never a coming back to where you were. Uh, you defeat the monster, but you are now transformed. You're in a new place. And I think that is very applicable to where we are with COVID. We're one day going to get to normal, but normal isn't going to look like what normal was before this all began uh, last February. I'm wondering if you see um, writing um, as changing as a result of this. You know, I'm thinking like, Abraham, how do you immerse yourself in a novel when there's a novel playing out, you know, right around you all the time? Does it change how we write? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm reading a lot of good writing, but I'm also reading a lot of bad writing. You know, there's a lot of, there, there's nothing stopping anyone from writing anything and publishing it, uh, you know, whether it's on a blog or self-publishing. And so again, it's very much like Twitter. I think you have to use the filtering function, but I think, you know, stories are fundamental to our lives and we we gravitate to ones that resonate with us typically because they're giving us some instructions for living and, and it can be a timeless old masterpiece or it can be some something current, but there is a standard and I think it's clear that you have to meet the standard. It's not enough to be just topical. Uh, you also have to fulfill these elements where the reader comes away satisfied, transformed, shares the epiphany that the hero shares. You know, so th those things I think are pretty timeless. They're human characteristics. The form changes, the topic changes, but the elements I don't think change that much. I, I wonder if um, with the experience I've had is that uh, people are reading less, they, their attention span is less. And there is, as Abraham points out, no shortage of writing. I mean, every which way you can find things. But the ones I find um, you know, most helpful and what I try to emulate are the ones that are uh, succinct and uh, astute. That is, they really convey some unique insights rather than just regurgitating something, you know, or other. Uh, because otherwise, I feel like it's just not helpful. Um, uh, you know, I think it's hard for, at least for me to try to write anything long these days, just because there's so much going on, as you touched on, Danielle, there's a novel, there's a movie going on and it's 
been a horror show and hopefully it's going to be a happy ending show out there. But, you know, I think um, the attention span was bad before, but I think it's even worse now. So are you writing a new book now, Eric, or you've given up? You're just going to do Twitter. I, I, well, I've thought about it, but if I, if I did do something, obviously I'll absorb by this. Um, it would have to be something I, I, I have no plan for it at this point, but it has to be something where I really thought it could contribute something meaningful, that it would fulfill those kind of criteria. And I haven't yet come to that. I mean, there's going to be so many books about how the United States, you know, effed it up so bad. I mean, you know that. Um, okay. But I, I don't want to do that. I mean, that's just, you know, just, but if, if, if it ever came as, as Abraham said, an epiphany of an angle that was just, you know, really mm -hmm. uh, unique, maybe. But no, at this point, no plan. I mean, here's my, my one thing. I mean, I appreciate that everyone's attention span is short. And, and so social media sort of fills that. And I think with COVID, you know, we wanted those quick things. But what I find that social media lacks is, you know, where, where does the nuance come in? Where, what happens with ambiguity, uh, vulnerability, which I think so much of that came up during this pandemic. And that doesn't translate well into 140 characters. I think we, we need the poets and the novelists and the people to write the 35,000 word articles to, to delve into them. And, and although we all say, oh, I can't read another book, I, I you know, um, how are we, how are we going to, how is social media going to do that if, uh, for all these other parts that the pandemic brings up? Yeah, well, that's the storytelling that you're not going to get. At least they went up to 280 characters. But, <laughs> no, there's, there's no storytelling uh, on Twitter or any social media. Uh, but that's what, you know, it, it you know, that's why when I mentioned Walter Isaacson's book, uh, Code Breaker, he's one of the great storytellers. I mean, uh, the people that can do that well it, are worth our, our time and our, um, you know, delving into. But, yeah, I mean, the ambiguity, you know, sh should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? How important is ventilation? Uh, not important. Um, all the schools opening, closed. I mean, everything you could think of, there's been ambiguity. All, at some point, if not constant ambiguity. And you don't get that straight now, you know, in a 280 character post or, or many posts. Absolutely. It makes me think, if I can put in a pitch for one thing that's both both concise and can be brief, but also can pull in nuance ambiguity, I would propose poetry. I think poetry has that unique ability to sort of dispense with the sort of fact-based narrative and take some essence of something ambiguous or, or, or vulnerable and, and pull that right out by, by using metaphor. And, and I know there's, we have a fraught history of thinking about illness as metaphor and whether that works or not, but, but maybe this would be the golden age of poetry, that this is a way to deal with both a short attention span, but the, I think, need. I think we, why do we read literary journals, if I have a stack back here? Why do we read, uh, want these things? Because getting those little facts about what the data are, are not enough. I mean, we need those. Those are important. But the difference between curing and healing, you can give the right antibiotic, you can cure that disease, the patient may still be miserable. We've missed, you know, something else is still there. And, you know, 500,000 people have died. Um, millions have survived COVID, but many of them still are in need of, of a lot. And, and the fact they've survived the disease isn't sufficient. That's obviously necessary. And so I, I will put in the pitch for poetry. Or maybe the, the novella will, will be the new, the new thing. Well, I'm like you. I love poetry. And I think uh, w one definition I once heard of poetry is it's when the head and the heart are saying the same thing. Uh, and poetry has that ability to sort of connect the facts with the feelings when it works well. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not why poetry isn't widely read. It doesn't take the country by storm the way the, a movie or a novel does. It should. Uh, but I find myself getting quite a bit of solace from reading poetry. And, you know, we talked about all the different forms of narrative, but there's been some interesting poetry, uh, you know, pub being published in many of the literary journals in the New Yorker and elsewhere that have really echoed the times in, in, a, in a beautiful way. Yeah. I mean, well, if you think about Amanda Gorman's poem yeah. that she read at the inauguration, that took the country by storm. I, and I and so, yeah. You know, one thing we haven't touched upon yet is sort of the, the intersection of the COVID pandemic with the recognition of systemic racism, the, the delayed reckoning of that that really came out with the murder of George Floyd. And I think that brought in a sort of another sort of current of, of writing that 
you know, I think wouldn't have happened without COVID. I, I think it wouldn't or it wouldn't have been received in the same way. And, and it may have just gotten signed. There was something about these things happening together that was inc- incredibly powerful. And I think, and her poem really demonstrated how you can pull that, because you're right, there's going to be, you know, encyclopedias written about this. But in a short poem, I thought she captured so much of that in a way that you could not look away. Oh, what she did for poetry in this country, you know, if not beyond, is extraordinary. Um, and I agree completely with you um, about this. Um, no, I I wonder, um, you know, where where this is headed. But, you know, the, 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 the power of poetry perhaps has been in this era has been especially uh, more pronounced. And as you say, the novella, it, these shorter ways of conveying powerful emotions, but also, you know, we, who, who would have thought the pandemic was bad enough? Mm-hmm. Did we also need George Floyd and all this to also, you know, to add to this yet another dimension of catastrophe uh, into a reckoning? which is still obviously uh, never been adequately addressed. So yeah, the depth of what's been going on here in this past year, I mean, I just can't imagine that, you know, so many different dimensions of, of horror that we've been living through and how we can get so numb because it's just so, it's so much at any given moment or time. I mean, it brings me back to Saramago's blindness that, that, you know, we maybe we do have an epidemic of blindness in so many aspects of, of life and, and reading a book like that, you know, it, you know, written years before all of this to me feels so relevant because it feels like a way of, oh, maybe that's where, where we are right now. And I don't have another way to put it into words. So um, I guess we're drawing to our, our close and, and I, I guess I'll sort of um, end with, um, you know, for our listeners or audience, or any, you know, who would you recommend that they, you know, read now, either from the ages or going forward? Who are people that we should keep an eye on, either a name or, or a class of people that we haven't heard from that you think might be important to sort of help us advance this story, this narrative of COVID? Well, I think since we started on that theme, I think making a plug for poetry, uh, making making a plug for African-American writing, which I think has always never gotten the recognition that it needs, whether it's, uh, you know, James Baldwin or many of the contemporary writers. I think um, there is so much there that we can take away. Uh, And this is, for me, this is the year for it. This is the time for it. So I'm doing a lot of that sort of reading. Well, besides the two of you, (laughs) um, you know, I I think... um, that, uh, you know, I, I saw the segment uh, on 60 Minutes of Colson Whitehead. I'm really stimulated to read his uh, novels. Um, they, they seem to be extraordinary. I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's certainly on my list. Um, you know, I think as far as uh, insightful people, like the people, like the kind of oppression, there's Zainab Tufeki uh, would fit the bill. She's a, a Turk who has this, you know, very unusual background in in um, uh, internet and um, kind of social aspects, but she ever, she seems to get everything right. It's just kind of amazing. And she's outside the the whole world of medicine and science, but she keeps on coming up with the right. Like, you know, a couple months ago, she wrote uh, an op-ed in the New York Times with Michael Mina about we should be thinking about one dose of the vaccine mm. as a temporizing measure. And now it's become, you know, right critical. She she questioned mask and ventilation. So I kid her. I told her her middle name is Prescient. And uh, so she's one who I follow now, uh, who I've gotten to know in, as a friend um, over the course of the pandemic. Yeah, I've been, I found it interesting, you know, for BLR, you know, we read manuscripts that come in from people and they really are a reflection of, of the times. We get about 4,000 submissions per year. And, you know, the batch that we're reading now has been really fascinating. There's a lot of writing, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, that's, those are grappling with those issues. And I'm really looking for voices we haven't heard from. You know, I, I think about the nursing home crisis and we've heard so little from the people who, who work there and, and, you know, the conditions that, that are next to impossible. And I really want to hear th- those voices. And I, I think from, 
you know, many of the countries who haven't had a lot of say, you know, and as we're watching the vaccine rollout and the inequities in that, you know, from international writers who have, you know, experienced it differently than, than we have. We, we often have blinders for where we are right now. And I'm just interested to look at those, those other uh, places. So I'm going to thank you both, uh, Abraham Verghese, Eric Topol. Um, I'm Danielle Ofri, and this is the Bellevue Literary Review. I invite you to check out BLR, and I'll also give an appreciation to Medscape for co-sponsoring this event. And uh, I hope you found it helpful, and please be in touch if you have questions, thoughts, you know where to find us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.